Hello. <laughs> okay, we're recording. Hello, hi. Hello. What's what's up, Andre? Hey, Shannon. Okay, first off, episode. Okay, I've been saying this since episode fucking like twenty, but every episode I'm gonna say it now. Episode twenty because I am flabbergasted myself to be honest. Episode twenty three. Can you believe it? Um. Um. Yes, because last week we recorded episode twenty two. That makes total sense. <laughs> I just sometimes feel like I have such a hard time sticking to things that that's why I'm like still surprised. Like, wow, like this is still like going on. <laughs> I mean, I think you did a great job of sticking to this. Like, I, I think you were dragging me along at some point. So. Aww, well, then you did a great job of sticking to it, too. <laughs> um, so and to the three people that are listening, um, we love you. <laughs> I know you guys are the OGs. You've done a great job of sticking as well. Um, yeah. No, but in all honesty, um, I wanted to share with the audience, actually, that recently, um, ooh, I don't recall the exact number, but we are over uh, 2,500 downloads now. So that's lit. Um, thank you, everyone. In all that's seriousness. Pretty thank you. lit. Pretty lit. Yeah. Thanks, so, guys. okay, Shannon, what are we talking about today? You introduced the topic, but, you know, I'll, I'll go first, but I want you to introduce it with your spooky <laughs> voice, please. I don't have a spooky voice. Unless oh, I never do. mind. That's just your voice. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, fine. So let me get all husky. We're going to do for like a 4 a.m. talk show. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. Welcome to Scary Talk. Have <laughs> you, you sound ever... Like one of those, <laughs> you sound like one of those, like... I, I feel like one time when I was like... 13 by accident i was on late night like watching cable late at night and there was this like porno there's like softcore oh porno <laughs> where there was like a woman on the radio like recounting the stories she was basically like the narrator Ew. and like then the scenes would take place like that's literally what this sounds like <laughs> jessica was waiting on her couch when there was a Ew. knock at the door was her pizza hot and ready it was the pizza man plumber carpenter <laughs> Little Caesars hit me up. I will do voice acting for you. <laughs> we will allow ourselves to be sponsored by the scummiest of companies. We don't care. Give us money. Hi. Um... <laughs> <laughs> We've had Little Caesars together. I know that. So, um, Well, if you're ready. <laughs> um, typically, we, we have someone introduce the history, you know, uh -huh. behind our subject. So I guess I'll say that for this particular subject, I had to go a little bit deep. I had to get my hands a little bit dirty. Mm -hmm. I had to summon the devil. Ooh. Because today, <laughs> because today, Andre, we're talking about cases in which people pleaded that the devil made them do it. Correct. Also, you summon the devil. What an utmost terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> to be fair, I didn't summon the devil. I and the devil. To, oh, um. <laughs> I went to uh, In and Out, which is kind of the same. Yeah, so. that's true. Um, <laughs> I have felt things while being there, so I, I abide by that. It is it, there's something weird going on there. That's all I'll say. Um, so the devil made me do it. Cases, basically, that's what we're gonna call this. Okay, um, allow me to start, Shannon. I have some crazy shit here to tell you. So today I'm going to be talking about the trial of R. and Shane Johnson. Uh, for those of you who don't know, which I assume is most of you since it was very popular at the time, but not in current time, the trial of R. and Shane Johnson um, is the devil, the, the devil made me do it case in, in American popular culture. That's basically what it's referred to as the first one of them, mind you, because there's yeah. been more since. But like the OG devil made me do it case is R. and Johnson. Uh, okay, so Aaron Johnson was this 19-year-old from Connecticut, uh, Brookfield, Connecticut. Oh, fun fact. Um, this was the first, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So 19-year-old from Brookfield, Connecticut, who in 1981 um, killed someone. Uh, he killed his landlord. This was the first murder ever in um, Brookfield, Connecticut. So I was surprised by that. But what's the background? <laughs> like, what's the tea? What happened? So um, this guy was a guy. <laughs> okay. It's just it's just so complicated. Okay. 
Actually, I'm gonna like go off my notes for real because I I, I researched this extensively. I don't think I actually need to look at them. I'm just gonna okay. go off my mind because and you don't need to cut this out. This is something that I think that like, the audience needs to know that sometimes when we go off notes, it actually becomes more confusing because we feel like we have to go by the structure of the notes. But I feel like in the end, I make sense when I ramble. Somehow it all connects. So I'm just gonna go like that. So this guy lived in Brookfield, Connecticut. In 1981, he was dating this girl. Um, her name was Debbie. Uh, now, Debbie Debbie Gladswell. Debbie Gladswell um, and him had been dating for about a year. Um, then all of a sudden, Debbie's little brother, David, uh, becomes possessed allegedly so this what? kid yeah so this kid was like 11 years old and and he's possessed ed and lorraine warren <laughs> come into the picture um because i guess the gladswell family uh was able to get a hold of them because they were also in like the new england area and actually that's not new england but like in the east that's where the warrens lived they were in the area or somehow they were able to get a hold of them so the warrens got involved in this family's case they attended four exorcisms that were um that were performed on this 11 year old and after the four exorcisms, um, the demon got out. Ha! But there's a caveat. How did it get out? Well, you see, during the fourth exorcism, this guy, Arn Johnson, our main subject here in this case, um, allegedly, according to Lorraine Warren's account, um, pleaded <laughs> because I guess this kid was like already like dying for so much exhaustion from the exorcisms. Um, he pleaded with um, the demon that was inside this kid uh, to like take him or like to get inside him and leave the kid alone. Lorraine Warren advised Aaron Johnson that this was a terrible idea. <laughs> but uh, as any yeah. bossy 19-year-old with not enough like like brain development, it was like, nope, I got this B come in. So the demon came in, and 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 the reason we know this, well, quote unquote, know this if you believe this, it's because um, Johnson later like alleged in an account that he um, like was driving one day soon after the exorcisms performed on uh, David, and um, he felt like that something took over him, and like his car got like wrapped around a tree, basically um he hmm. like blacked out he saw some like weird figure like approach him and then like he crashed he was fine though he survived um and he he was like oh something's happening at that point like he knew that maybe what he had done had worked and now the demon actually had entered his body um so he freaks out some more at some point i guess he decides to visit um a well where he believed the demon lived it's not clear how he acquired this information but a nearby well he thought that that's where the demon resided i guess like or or its power or something so he goes to this well he said that he looked into the well he looked into the water um and made eye contact with the demon which i'm confused how he would do that if the demon was already inside him um yeah. but i guess maybe it wasn't like maybe he hadn't actually been like officially possessed yet like the paperwork by the demon council hadn't been like signed yet and so <laughs> um he looks at this like demon's reflection in the water and he says like that's when like shit really kicked off um he like blacked out for a couple of hours and uh then the girlfriend uh recounts that uh, like as the days would pass she would notice that he would just kind of sit for hours sometimes and just growl and speak at himself um and, oh that's yeah, normal <laughs> yeah like a little rumbling just like growl and then like he'd like come out of that trance and not remember what what had happened and he'd just be like normal um and okay so now we get to the murder so in what's it november yeah november of 1981 uh, okay so i forgot to mention that david the little kid after the exorcisms took place um he got quote unquote i guess liberated from the demon however he was very weak um and he was still recovering from that I guess at one point he actually got worse. He was not recovering anymore. Uh, and the family decided to move elsewhere um, to relocate to like in 
a closer facility so it would be easier to take care of him something along those lines it's not exactly clear why they moved but that's the presumption so the family moves and by the family i mean david's family which includes debbie uh, sorry includes uh david uh his older sister debbie who was dating archie and johnson at the time and uh debbie's uh younger brother carl gladswell um who will come into the picture later uh, so it's Gladstills, actually. I've been saying Gladstill this whole time, but it's the Gladstill family, not Gladstill. Mm, so the Gladstills okay. move homes. In November of 1981, uh, again, the family moves homes. Debbie gets a new job. She gets a new job um, dog walking at a local kennel for a man called uh, Alan, Alan Bono. Alan Bono. Now, Alan... He's a great boss and everything, but I guess he's a raging alcoholic. And so one day, um, so just stick with me here. It's complicated, everyone. Mm -hmm. Arn takes the day of work because he's not feeling well. He heads mm -hmm. over to his girlfriend, Debbie's work, the kennel where she walks dogs, uh, and she works for Alan Bono. And him and Bono hang out with David's sorry with Arn's younger sister Wanda and Debbie's um younger cousin Mary I'm just recounting all of this from memory by the way <laughs> who are also oh present who are present there um uh, because I guess you take little kids to work in the 80s I don't know and also she yeah. was walking dogs <laughs> like it's not that big a deal I guess whatever yeah. but there were two little kids there uh one the murderer's uh, little sister, Juan, the murderer's girlfriend's little cousin. So Mary and Wanda are fucking, fucking around, getting lit like little kids do. They were like 10. And um, <laughs> how do 10 year olds get lit? I don't know. And at some point, Debbie was like, you know what? Like, y'all is hungry. Let's get some pizza. So, but, but she knew that she had to be, I guess, like the boss had left for a while and she went to get some pizza. Like she left her job, which she like shouldn't have basically for like 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, and, and she tried to hurry because she knew that, um, like if she took too long, she'd get caught, whatever. So I guess that she gets caught because by the time she's back with pizza and the kids, the guy is like, you're like, yo, what the fuck? Like you took too long and like you weren't supposed to leave to begin with. Debbie is able to take Wanda with her, um, like away from the scene because, uh, Alan is drunk now and getting very angry at her. And so like she grabs Mary. I'm not sure why she didn't grab um, sorry, she grabs Wanda. I'm not sure why she didn't grab Mary as well, but she didn't. And so Alan, this like guy who's like drunk right now and is yelling at his employee and these two little girls, um, grabs onto Mary, this 10 year old girl who has nothing to do with anything and starts like yelling at her, like, like tugging her by the arm, uh, like what the fuck? Like you pizza. Like, I don't know. It's very bizarre. Oh my God. Um, and Arn, I guess, gets very upset at this scene, at the sight of this. And um, the two men then all of a sudden start arguing. Like, Mary, the little 10-year-old, can finally flee alongside the other little girl and Debbie. And the two men are the only ones left at the scene. But Debbie is still able to witness that, you know, one moment to the other, all of a sudden, Arn has a knife out and he has stabbed <gasps> this man 20 times. Um, 20 times? Yeah, 20 times. As he was rumbling and growling, by the way so that's not that's <laughs> not like one second i looked away and then next there was 20 right. slices no, no, she, into she, my boss she saw she saw so okay <laughs> yeah um um so that's the murder question so far <laughs> i am glad the 10 year olds peaced out at this point um i think it might be an overreaction to stab your girlfriend's <laughs> boss yeah you think this um, um just a little bit maybe if she had brought like a lot more pizzas maybe i don't know <laughs> um i'm wondering though i guess i just want to know like do we think that it was demons or do we think arn just has a temper i do think it was a demon and here's why so something that i neglected to mention was that so remember when the little boy was possessed um, yes. the girlfriend's little brother so uh, the little boy had very intense experiences that he recounted at the time a lot of it he has apparently like years later now in present times he has tried to like 
backtrack but at the moment that he mm-hmm. recounted all these things he like very vividly stated that he would see like this figure terrifying terrifying him and pushing him uh, it, it's important to know that the kid didn't have any prior history of mental illness um there's mm-hmm. also the claim from Lorian warren that when they were exercising this kid they saw him levitate um so that's why I think it was a demon because there's like a lot of shit that was really crazy. Like the kid would also apparently growl and like like would have that like low rumble. Uh, at one point during the exorcisms, he he started like citing passages of the Bible in Latin. He also like named forty three demons by their names out loud. He was spitting at the <laughs> priest. Um, yeah, so like crazy shit. Um, that's why I think it was a demon. And like if, if it was a demon in that boy, then that means that what was transferred to Arn was the same demon it was a demon so i do think i don't know i think i think there's an argument to be made well isn't it also possible that maybe the kid was possessed but arn used that as an excuse like he wasn't actually possessed but he knew that because this kid supposedly was and he had asked for it to come in or whatever that that's like the perfect excuse and people would believe it i mean that would be the perfect excuse um that just that's, that would be such a convenient coincidence, though, that like he asked for the demon to do that, and then all of a sudden, well, a couple of days later, he got to kill someone. <laughs> I, I, not yeah. a coincidence if it was meditated. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't even know the landlord at the time. Do you think he just thought, I just know I want to kill someone in the future, near future? So I'm gonna. I mean, some people are like that. <laughs> I don't know. Um. <laughs> So, oh, oh, this is really good, by the way. I forgot to mention also about the kid. Apparent, okay, this is very, very important. So, David, during one of the exorcisms, he um, demonstrated the supernatural ability of precognition. How? Hmm. Because he said um, that a quote unquote uh, murder without, um, how was it like murder without cause, purpose, or motive would take place? He said that in one of his demonic growly voices to Arn's face as Arn was in the room during one of the exorcisms. And like lo and behold, this motherfucker killed someone a couple of weeks later. Um, so mm. it, I mean, it seems to me that there was a demon there. The demon could see the future. The demon saw that like Arn was gonna kill someone and said it through the kid. So Yeah, that that's interesting because what if the demon was saying like they were warning them like hey like this dude's gonna kill someone it's not my fault though i'm a demon but i'm not a bad demon i'm not a bad guy (laughs) (laughs) a little bit (laughs) Um, it's possible it's no more impossible than demons just being chill or wanting to kill they can do what they want if we're gonna believe in demons, we can believe they can do what they want. Fair, fair, <laughs> fine. Maybe he was like, "Listen, like I, I, I fuck up kids, but I'm not about to kill no landlord." Um, yeah, like most exorcisms don't end in someone killing someone. Why did this one? I suppose, it, it wasn't the yeah, demon's fault. They just end in like a slow, painful death. You're totally right. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, this guy's killed again. Five inch pocket knife, twenty times stabbed repeatedly. The guy died several hours later. Um, he, oh, he, one of the cuts uh, was stretched from his stomach to the base of his heart. So, Ew, what some the fuck? gross fucking shit. Yeah, crazy. So he, this guy was enraged. Whether it was a demon or not, like whatever it was, was man it was powerful rage in there. Um, again, first murder in the history of this town, which I thought was really surprising. I feel like I don't know murders happen all the time everywhere, but I guess. Not till 1981 here. Um, what did the girlfriend have to say? The girlfriend then and to this day believes the demonic account. So she's like, he was mm. possessed. I saw the rumbling. I saw the weird growling. This guy wasn't crazy before the exorcisms. So why would he do that? And also I saw when it happened and it was like his soul had left his eyes. Like when like he was stabbing the landlord, like it wasn't him. So, which I mean, I guess if you're like stabbing someone to death, of course you're not gonna be you for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's what she saw. But I don't know, dude. I, like, I kind of believe the whole demon thing. Uh, I don't know what I believe, but I do kind of think like there is like that snap we've been talking about psychologically, where like mental illness can make it seem like you're not yourself. You know, right, but... right, right, right. And he didn't levitate. There's no one saying that he did. He did not levitate. Just the kit, correct. 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's quite cut and dry. I think that we don't have enough information here. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the trial and the aftermath. So, okay, this is super interesting. A day after the murder, Lorraine Warren informed the Brookfield police that Johnson was possessed when the crime was committed. I find this super duper interesting that they decided to actively involve themselves, not only in the preceding exorcisms that happened to this kid, but like once a murder came out of it allegedly because this demon was causing even more havoc they still were like yep we're gonna be part of this like to me it'd be like this is gonna be a shit storm i do not want to be part of it but i guess yeah. the warrens were like super in with it they were okay so they were still involved lorraine called the police the next day to be like hey like before anyone says anything let me like set it straight he was actually possessed when he killed this man so he's not guilty like she already knew what oh, was dear. coming i'm guessing um yeah. there was a media blitz that surrounded the story um <laughs> fueled in part by the warrens whose agents promised that lectures a book and even a movie detailing the gruesome case were in the works so oh my god that was kind of weird to read i was like mm. <laughs> Maybe this is yeah. all just a farce and they just want to make some money and somehow, I don't know, there's a lot more behind the scenes that we don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Well, I've never really been a supporter of Edward Lorraine Warren because there's like hundreds of accounts of people saying that they lied or they would try and like just use people for money and they prove time and time again that they were getting stuff wrong psychically or whatever on, like on public TV. But then again you know like the psychic world doesn't always work like that <laughs> right i don't know i mean yeah i don't ask, really know ask long island medium <laughs> she'll tell you it doesn't work like that yeah yeah exactly <laughs> or is that just a convenient lie but you never know <laughs> johnny your brother's calling you from the afterlife <laughs> He wants my you to brother's come back, right there. <laughs> <laughs> I know. My brother's in the next room. <laughs> oh, shit. It was actually. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. Dear. It was actually Tony, the cake boss. He's calling you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think he's okay. Tony right? is not dead. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> Uh, okay, so okay, so Martin Manella was uh, Arn's lawyer, and he uh, actually traveled to Europe. He traveled to London to hear about two similar cases. Other people who had been like, "The devil made me do it." Again, this was the first one in the U.S., but not the first one in the world. So, like, there had already been a couple of these kind of cases in Europe. He traveled once he basically like assigned himself to this case to Europe to find out more about what these cases were about. Um, and once he did that, he tried to gather as much evidence as possible. He threatened to subpoena the priest who oversaw David's exorcisms if they did not cooperate with the defense because he thought that the evidence that they had to offer was too substantial for them to just like cup out, um, which I agree. Um, especially if you're going to argue that the demon did it like you have to yeah. establish that the demon's existence is like present and viable and accurate and so like the, the priest could be like yep the demon's real um <laughs> so anyway october 28th 1981 is when the trial took place so when, when it started um the defense um basically was like Oh, by virtue of possession, this guy is not guilty because it was actually the demon who did it. However, uh, preceding judge Robert Callahan was like, this is quote unquote, irrelative and unscientific. That's the quote. Um, and so he did not allow testimony regarding that angle because he was like, it just cannot be proven that that is the case. Like it literally could not be proven. And so we just cannot go with that line of logic. Um, the defense gave up on that pretty quickly and they they like switched their angle to actually it was self-defense uh and and at oh. that point they kind of <laughs> fucked up anything that they had presented prior to that regarding demons yeah. they also fucked up well i mean they invalidated any um testimony that the priest might have given because i mean it becomes relevant what the priest have to say when you're no longer talking about anything religious right um you're right. just talking about a regular crime and it was just self-defense um so in the, the jury, which apparently a lot of them were very interested in like deliberating um, with this in mind, with the whole demon stuff in mind, they also obviously weren't able to use this stuff anymore. Um, in the end, they deliberated for three days and they came to the conclusion that the guy was uh, guilty of first degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He only served five, though. 
um you think <gasps> the demons are five? the other 15 uh <laughs> yeah Shit. i know um that's nothing for stabbing someone 20 times i know um I don't know. Jesus. I thought about that too. I thought about that too a lot. Like, damn, ten to twenty years, and he only served five. But, That's crazy. Okay. Um, so in nineteen eighty three, this guy Gerald Brittle, um, he's an author with the assistance of Lorraine Warren, published a book about the incident called "The Devil in Connecticut." Lorraine Warren has stated many times that profits from the book were shared with the family, which I thought was an interesting fact to point out, and also something very good <laughs> good for them um because I, I i i highlighted that when i was reading this because i recalled that when i was reading about the amenable horror um case that like some of the books that were written like the family got nothing and it was like a hot fucking like litigation mess and that did not happen here um and until 2006 sorry <laughs> it, <laughs> something did happen um and that is that uh, the book was republished and David, the, the kid, which is now like he's now an, a man, and Carl uh, Gladsell, his brother, um, sued the authors and the book publishers for violating their right to privacy, for libel, and for quote unquote intentional oh. affliction of emotional distress. Oh. And this is because the brother, Carl, he claimed that the book uh, alleged that he committed criminal and abusive acts against his family and others. Um, Carl also said that the mm. possession story was a hoax concocted by Ed and Lorraine Warren to exploit the family and David's mental illness, which Carl claims he had during the exorcisms and continues to have. Uh, and that the book presented him, Carl, as the villain because he did not believe in the supernatural claims when the rest of his family did. So, thoughts. Wow. Come through, Carl. I know. Fight for your right. <laughs> the, a member of the, of the very family that you know like this all blew up because it's like nope all bullshit and fucking yeah. yeah yeah and he was coming forth and saying like no like he was mentally ill <laughs> like yeah. all this stuff that like didn't come up earlier he so... came for Lorraine Warren's dusty wig um yes he did <laughs> yes he did um did did he win he it was settled out of court okay yeah Okay. But um, still, I, I I just find it super interesting what he said while this like litigation was getting set up. He also asserted that the Warrens apparently had told him that the story was going to make the family millions and it would help get oh, um, these people aren't out oh of jail. God. But listen, 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 listen. In their defense, I, for me, it's like, so what? Like, that's not a bad... That doesn't invalidate that there was a demon, number one. It simply is them trying to give the poor Gladstone family who's already going through a lot business advice. Like, you know? Yeah, I guess that's true. But you also have to think about if their name is going on it, are they going to keep a lot of the money and I mean, the family's they, not they going to see any of it? I mean, un unless I don't understand inflation, it does seem like they kept a lot of the money. Or maybe the book just didn't sell a lot. But the family only got $2,000 and the warrants must have gotten the rest. <laughs> Uh, uh slash the publisher so <sighs> that's a, yeah that's crazy yeah um according to carl the publicity generated by the incident forced him to drop out of school and lose friends and business opportunities and so he's currently writing a book himself titled alone through the valley about his version of the events surrounding his brother <laughs> and just for the title you can tell that it's gonna be uh you know like i had to figure it out on my time. own the family's fucking crazy oh. i'm the only sane one <laughs> Um. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like the plot to the haunting of hill house <laughs> yeah yeah um lorraine warren to this day well not anymore she's dead defends her work with the family she stated that the six sprees who were involved in the incident all agreed at the time that the boy was possessed and that the events that she described in the book were real um the author of the book says that he wrote the book because the family wanted the story told that's a quote uh and mm. that he possesses video of over 100 hours of his interviews with the family and that they signed up on the book as accurate before it went to print and by members of the family i mean including david which is the most interesting part like i said david wow. later in his life kind of tried to backtrack 
all that he said about yeah i totally believe that i was possessed he said that when he was a little kid he said that when he was a teen like yes all that happened is real i believe it i believe there was a demon inside of me but later in like his 30s and 40s and in more recent times he's sided with his brother carl who never believed in it ever um and it's like no i think my brother carl is right i had mental illness and my like parents exploited that basically uh one they didn't know how to treat me and two once i got better somehow they still exploited the fact that (laughs) i had it when i had it um yeah by you know this whole fucking media blitz and shit um he, he doesn't really comment on the Arn situation, though. He's never been, like, turns, like, Dave, because, you know, David doesn't believe he, he was possessed anymore. But he's never said, like, oh, because I wasn't possessed, that means that actually Arn had no demon in him. And he's just a fucking crazy person. He d- doesn't really comment on that. And here's the kicker. He doesn't comment on that. And uh, Carl also doesn't really comment on Arn. They stay out of that part of the story. They only concern themselves with the glad cell part of the story which is david's possession alleged possession uh, because up uh, to r- right now <laughs> De- uh arn and uh debbie glad are married <laughs> uh they're together so after arn went to jail for five years for stabbing a man to death 20 times with debbie witness um i guess he got out and he was like i still love you and he must have told her, you know what, it, it really was a demon. And she was like, I believe you, we're lit now, we're cool. And they kissed and they're married. So, mm. yep. <laughs> and and mm. obvi- obviously, like, <laughs> I, I know what you're thinking. But obviously, uh, what I was going to say is that obviously David and Carl are not going to want to really come into an Arn since, you know, like their sister is married to him. I don't know how much they really want to get into that. Yeah. Um, so there's that fun um, family get togethers i'm sure <laughs> yeah thoughts <laughs> uh well i think the david thing makes sense he was a child it's not that hard to coerce a child into saying or signing anything like they don't really know what's going on anyway if someone's saying like we're gonna make your family money like just agree to this book being correct it's like sure why not i want money i want to fucking tricycle i don't know um <laughs> i mean he did he did cite i mean allegedly cite those passages from the bible in latin like how did he do that and also if he did levitate that's obviously a, like a like that's undeniable but there, again we can't prove that he did i saw i was in a deep hole on youtube one night this week and i saw this youtube video of like this girl who's like probably like middle school entering high school and like her life is about jesus and she has mm-hmm. post-it notes in her room of all these bible verses and it's like oh dear and i'm not saying like that's wrong it's just you have to watch this it's like pathological it's like culty and weird and you know it, whatever works for you i guess but i'm saying like it's it's if if this religion has lasted so long i'm sure a kid can remember a few bible verses um, they can remember mm. the lyrics to my humps. At least I can. So, I guess <laughs> this is basically the Bible. So, yeah. Um, okay. Well, last detail. Um, uh, Gladsell's father, like the the Gladsell's dad, um, Carl Gladsell Senior, denies telling the author of the book that his son was possessed. So that's actually very interesting. Mm-hmm. Like, y- you know, if someone was coercive towards the child, I guess it would only. It could, it could have only been the mom because the dad is saying now like nope I never said he was possessed so he's really not saying that he be- I mean he's also not it's just like these fucking like ambiguous ass statements from the family but anyway basically the dad is saying that he he didn't say that the kid was possessed but he's not saying that he thinks that he he wasn't you know what I'm saying um, so he's I don't know what the dad the really thinks <laughs> basically but um, but he he does clarify that he never said that he was someone's possessed because that was important uh when there was like litigation going on about the book um and, and you because you know how um the author was like the family all said like that this were the facts and i have interviews with them um the dad in response is, that's why he had to say that he was like well i never actually said that some of my son was possessed so don't quote me on that right and um, you don't want to say anything that firm anyway because you don't want things to get misconstrued or turned around right and finally if there was any question about it obviously the now happily married couple of johnson and debbie um support the warren's account of demonic possession wholeheartedly of course uh, they do he and they have stated <laughs> that the glad cells debbie's own family which is so heartbreaking um uh she said you know they're actually just they're suing for money like 
the book is right they shouldn't be suing the publisher for whatever because they are in denial so there's my case <laughs> if if my lover were to stab someone 20 times and claim that it was the demon that possessed them I would be like oh that's interesting okay I'm gonna go get the car ready um, I'll be outside and then you'll just hear me drive away and that'll be it <laughs> That that will be it for our relationship. I mean, I mean, okay, like she saw all. The, okay, one, she saw her little brother possessed. We don't know how shocking what she saw in person must have been. We really just do not know. Second, when Arn, let's say that Arnie had no ulterior motives and he really just, you know, like he had nothing pre-planned or whatever. Imagine seeing this guy be like, "Demon, take me!" And then strange shit starts happening to him. Like, how could you not string those things together well, and believe it that does, there was a demon? It fits a narrative. It follows like an actual plot of yes, he. I saw him ask this. My brother's possessed, and then he claims that he saw a figure. But these are all just claims, and that's kind of why the judge said too, like, I can't prove this. So either he's I, telling I the mean, truth or he isn't. And I think. Especially because in the first episode, we kind of were unable to find proof of demonic possession. I just don't think that it's entirely substantial. But that doesn't mean that it's not true. Like like I said, I'm going to be yeah. the dad and say, we, don't, we still don't know, you know? And I don't know that we'll ever have, like, definite proof of what I am saying is that while the claims of the figures and the whatever is, like, are obviously... <sighs> hard to validate like the actual eyewitness testimony of what was happening to like like david's like weakening physical condition following the exorcisms and also aren't strange aggressive behavior like those can be verified by more than one person and like that doesn't mean that doesn't mean demon but you know what i mean like it does fall on narrative yeah. and there, there are strange they are strange facts and so all i'm saying is like that's what to me that's what yeah. allows me to make the argument that maybe it was a demon i can see how it could be believable but i can also see how it's just a good way to get away with something because i if you're gonna murder someone um <laughs> I, and you're possessed by a demon. Like, say that you're possessed by a demon, and then the demon's telling you to kill someone. Like, I guess 20 times would be the aggressive demon being like, ah, I'm a, I'm a demon, I want to do this aggressively. But also, it's like, is the demon still in him? Why doesn't he kill people more now? Like, what's happening with that? I like, was about to say that. I was about to say that, um... I was about to play devil's advocate. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> so, um, no, I was about to say that, you know, one way to kind of try and debunk this whole thing and say, actually, there was no demon ever is, or maybe or maybe ju there just wasn't one with Arn, at least, um, is, well, when the fuck did the demon leave his body? Like, after the killing? If so, why? Is that how demons work? I don't think so. Like, don't they just stay? Don't they just want to host forever? Because a human host is, like, valuable to them. Because they can wreak havoc in the physical world more easily. Like, even like, how are they married now and everything is yeah. fine? Like, is the demon just chill now? Right. Is he part of the family? Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's a convenient excuse. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, if you can't, like, did he get an exorcism in prison? <laughs> like, you know? I mean, if, it, I mean, that would make sense. But if there was one, there's no record of it anywhere. So it's just... I don't know. I just keep coming back to like it's it's very convenient to have this opportunity fall into your lap of being like, I'll take the demon for you, no problem. Hey, I I, I think I might be possessed. Um, if I do anything weird, just know it wasn't me, you know. <laughs> but to each their own, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, you know, for now, actually, I'm going to stay undecided. I know where you stand, though. Let's go to the next case. What you got for me? Well, like I said, I think before we started recording, it's kind of anticlimactic. <laughs> but I had already <laughs> been so deep into this and I had done so much research that I was like, I have to follow through. But um, <laughs> yeah, so this is actually a really popular case. It's something that I don't feel fully... Like, I'm not, like, an expert on this case. So for anyone listening, you might know more than me. But to this is the case of David Berkowitz. He was a serial killer. He was the first, like, serial killer in New York City, basically. Okay. Um, this happened in the 70s. So he was also known as the Son of Sam, which is creepy in and of itself. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I guess I don't know if I'm gonna read from my notes fully or if I'm just gonna try and free fall down this whole mess. But basically, this guy David Berkowitz, he claimed that he committed these crimes, his serial killings, his attacks, because not all of his victims died. Um, he did it because a devil dog told him to. And I find that interesting personally because when you talk about witchcraft or whatever, we always have like the demon familiar or the devil in the form of a creature, normally a dog. And it's coming to mm -hmm. you and saying like, I'll give you stuff if you do this. And I'm not saying that this is the situation because I don't think it was, but I find it interesting that in his construction of this narrative, he was like, it was a dog. <laughs> um, yeah. And he stuck to that. He stuck to it for a long time. Um, so I guess just to kind of give you some background on this, um, Berkowitz, he was born in 1953 to a guy named Richard David Falco. And his mother and this guy Richard, they were not the best couple. They were going through it. Let's just say Richard was a piece of dung. Um, that's a scientific okay. term. He's a piece of dung, <laughs> and she gave David away a few days after his birth. So he was adopted by oh. a, a couple in the Bronx. And at that point, he... Oh, I'm so sorry. I completely fucked this up. <laughs> the dad wasn't named Richard David Falco. That was David Berkowitz's real name. So, oh, okay. yeah. So I forgot what the dad's name was, but he was a piece of dung anyway. Don't forget that. So okay. they changed his name. They switched it around. So instead of being Richard David, they changed it to David Richard Berkowitz, which is kind of interesting, <laughs> kind of weird. I don't know yeah. why you would do that, but that's what they did. <laughs> I thought that was weird. Um, so his adoptive parents were Jewish American retailers. They didn't make a lot of money, but made enough to survive in the Bronx during this area. They mm -hmm. seemed like pretty chill people, honestly, like better people than like. So I don't think that he lost out in any way with this scenario. Okay. Um, which is good, but with a lot of serial killers or murderers, you can kind of see at an early age that there are issues, and he is not an exception to this rule, which is kind of sad, because a lot of people spend their whole life in the system, and then you get a psychopath kid, and it's like, mm, is it the devil, or is my kid kind of fucked up? <laughs> so... <laughs> you should write a book titled that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a self-help book for understanding your family. Um, so, Berkowitz was not interested in school at an early age. He was prone to setting fires and petty larceny. Hmm. Um, neighbors said that he was a difficult, spoiled child and a bully. And... Um, yeah, I guess those aren't great things you want to hear about your kid. I think people can turn it around. But if you're setting fires at an early age, it's kind of a warning sign. Agreed. Yeah, let's not do that. So his parents actually did consult at least one psychotherapist. <laughs> Arson? Not my son. <laughs> <laughs> they saw at least one psychotherapist to talk about his misbehavior, but they weren't able to come to any conclusions about him. He was never diagnosed with anything as a kid. Um, mm. and unfortunately his mother died when he was 14 and he didn't like his new stepmom. So his life became kind of crappy, you know, kind of strange. Mm -hmm. And then at 17, he joins the U S army and he serves in the U S and South Korea. And then he was on honorably discharged in 1974. And this is kind of when things start to unravel for him. And he, he's out of the army and he decides that he wants to find his birth mom which was mm. not a good idea. Um, so he finds her. <laughs> and mm. she basically breaks the news to him. Like, yeah, you were illegitimate and your father was abusive and awful. So I got rid of you. And Lit. this kind of, this is like, if you're looking for a reason to snap, like this was his reason. Like, I think a lot of psychopaths right. have that situation where they just need a reason, even like the smallest thing. Um, so a forensic anthropologist, Elliot Layton, he actually says like, this was the moment where this like the primary crisis of his life is to learn that. And as an adopted kid, it just, it shattered his sense of identity. Like he doesn't really have strong parental figures, I guess. I don't know. Right. Basically made him crazy. <laughs> so in the 1970s, this is when he starts to commit his crimes and 
like I said, he claims that it was a dog that told him to do these things. So just keep that in mind as we're going. I'll give you more information on the dog later because I want this to kind of be... I want it to be separate so that you can decide after you hear what he did, if this was a demon or not. So, okay. So yeah. And he did a lot. He, he did a lot. <laughs> so on Christmas Eve in 1975, he decided to stab two women with a hunting knife. Um, one was a teenager and one survived. So it's, I guess that's good. One survived. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. In the, an area of the Bronx, this was at about at 1 a.m. in this, in 1976, so the next year, um, this 18-year-old girl, Donna Donna Loria, and her friend Jody Valenti, they were sitting in Jody's car. And these this killer, this dude, like he's the reason I don't want to sit in cars at night anymore. Like I used to do that all the time, just like talking to people, and now I'm like... I'm going to die if I do this. So just be aware of your surroundings, guys. Um, So these two girls were sitting in their car and they were just talking. And Donna went to leave to like go home or whatever. And then this man is just like approaching her quickly. He crouches to the ground and he pulls out a gun. And he shot her and she died instantly. Um, What the fuck? Yeah, he fired off a few other shots and Jody was still in the car. She got hit in the thigh. Um, and then another one, he fired a third shot that, um, missed both of the girls, but only Donna died. So Jody survived. She didn't recognize him. She tried to give his description to the police and, um, Loria, Donna, I think Donna, Loria's father said, um, that they'd seen a man matching that description in a yellow car nearby. So they were kind of failing miserably at catching this guy because this goes on for over a year i think maybe two years Mm -hmm. so suck a dick i don't know i don't know dang fuck yeah um (laughs) so this one's kind of scary in 1976 the same year in queens this is in october so it's getting kind of late but um carl denaro i think that's how you say his name he's 20 he's with rosemary keenan 18 and they're sitting in the parked car when a window shatters and they drive away very quickly because they're just scared. They don't know that it's necessarily a gun or that someone's shooting at them. And mm-hmm. Denaro, Carl, he was uh, bleeding from a bullet to the head and he had shoulder length hair. So the police believe that if the shooter was looking from the back and that's where he shot, he thought it was a girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And Carl actually survived. It's just that he had to get a metal plate in his head. Like, can you imagine getting shot in the head and surviving? Because, wow. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. And then November, the next month, 1976, um, a girl, teenager, she's 16 years old, Donna Damasi. She and this girl, Joanne Lomino, they were walking home from a movie after midnight and they were chatting on the porch of their home. And this guy just walks up. And I'm saying this guy because there's some points of contention with this. So just bear with me here. This guy Mm -hmm. in military fatigues approaches them and he begins to ask directions. No sooner after is he like mid-sentence, he pulls out a gun and shoots them. Um runs off so Tomasi was shot in the neck but she survived and Lomino survived as well but she was rendered a paraplegic Um, how the fuck are these people surviving these shots to the upper body I know it's really crazy and it sucks because they're literally just on their porch at home like you literally are just not safe anywhere which I think a lot of people don't think about often because paranoia and stuff but it's like just live your life you know hopefully that won't won't happen you know yeah so a couple months later in January 1976, um, a girl, Christine Froon, she's 26. She's with her fiance. He's 30. His name's John Deal. And they're sitting in Queens in the car after seeing the movie Rocky, which is a fun detail. You know, you don't go to Rocky and you think something bad's going to happen to me after this. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so three gunshots penetrate the car and John drove away for help and Froon unfortunately was shot twice and she died at the hospital Dang. yeah this is just all very miserable and I was not gonna talk about it all necessarily but I feel like I kind of have to because the, the victims are definitely the most important part because they don't deserve this so let's not give too much attention right. to David fuck him um, 
<laughs> so in March, a couple months later. Yeah, fuck you, David. <laughs> fuck you, man. <laughs> Um, in March 1977, a Columbia University student named Virginia, she's 19, she's walking home, and she's confronted by a man, and this is kind of scary. Um, I think this is probably the most traumatic one, in my opinion, for no reason. I just think it's scary. She had heard about Christine Froon getting shot. She lived a block away from her, so she was kind of already paranoid. And she sees this guy approaching her. So she lifts her textbooks between herself and the man. But he shoots her and they go straight through the textbooks and hit her in the head. Oh, no. So that didn't work. And that really sucks because shit. (laughs) So fuck! imagine like knowing you're about to die. Yeah, that would suck. But then again, like, don't you kind of want to know that way you can like be aware of the moment just in case anything does happen after. I guess. (laughs) I don't know. So a neighbor said that they saw a husky teenage boy and another person um, who looked like Berkowitz loitering in the area. And they saw the teen sprinting away after the shooting. There's another shooting in another car um, with a guy, Alexander. He's 20 and a girl, Valentina. Um, This was pretty close to one of the other shootings and both of these people died. This is still 1977 and let me just point out that this has been going on for probably two years at this point and the police have literally nothing um Mm -hmm. so that says a lot about police (laughs) at least Mm -hmm. in this time good job guys (laughs) um they started getting letters from (laughs) from someone claiming to be the killer and it's this is very zodiac and very weird um let me see yeah also it. like if you have to get like if the if the killer has to literally like out themselves with cryptic letters in order for you to catch them you're not doing your job i completely agree i completely agree <laughs> that's okay so here is just i'm gonna kind of skim over the letter and just kind of read a little bit of it so this is what he sent to nypd captain joseph borelli and he sent a few but this is just one of them so, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. He spelled woman, W-E-M-O-N. Interesting. Mm. And he says, I am not, I, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. When Father Sam gets drunk, he's- <laughs> I am kid. not, but I am dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, Attention all police, shoot me first, shoot to kill or else. Keep out of my way or he will die. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. Oh, and Dude, <laughs> that's so fucking Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. If you've ever seen it, I think there's basically like an old dude at the end who like the killings are being done in the name of so that the bodies can be like brought to him and he can like suck out young blood. Oh, that's creepy. I did not know that. I haven't actually yeah. seen that movie yet. Yeah, like the original one that's that's crazy yeah and so in this letter he also refers to himself as Beezlebub and other weird things he says that he must honor thy father and all this weird weird demonic weird shit Ugh, he's so extra Beezlebub are you kidding me yeah exactly it's it's very creepy um so yeah he's claiming that basically he needs to satiate Sam or whatever so this is when they start calling him son of Sam mm. and Obviously, they haven't caught him. They have no fucking leads at all. Like, they have a description, but nothing really to go on. Um, Mm -hmm. So, basically, there is another shooting of another couple, and they're pretty young, too, which is sad. And then, lo and behold, a few days later, another couple is shot. Um, Yeah, so basically, the cops are fucking failing at this point. Like, there are so many victims (laughs) of the CIA. Yeah. (laughs) Um... Luckily, they are, like, eventually they're able to catch him, and the the way they catch him is witnesses talking about the car again, the yellow car, and so they track down the car based on, I think, like, video footage, and they break into his apartment, are, so... Are they ever gonna, are they ever gonna say, like, they were so fucking terrible, the only way they could catch him was with a Home Alone-style booby trap? Oh, Just my like... God. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, maybe. <laughs> So they break into his apartment and they find that on the walls is a bunch of satanic graffiti and he has tons and tons of diaries that are noting his arson that that basically he makes claims that 
he started over 1400 fire incidents in new york which might be possible i don't know maybe he's just crazy Mm -hmm. And this guy didn't put up much of a fight. Like, after saying, like, shoot me on command, blah, 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 he didn't really, like, give them any trouble, which is interesting. And Mm -hmm. here is where he claims that a dog did it. So, in investigations, he said that his neighbor's dog demanded the blood of pretty girls. He said that Sam, um, Sam Carr, he was the former neighbor of Berkowitz, he was the owner of the dog. And it's just like a black Labrador. Poor dog, honestly. (laughs) Getting all this blame. Um, So he believed very deeply that Carr's dog, um, Harvey was his name, was possessed by an ancient demon. And that it issued irresistible demands that Berkowitz kill. Um, (laughs) Okay. That sounds like schizophrenia to me. Yeah, it sounds like mental illness to me, too. Um, Yeah. So, what did the law think? Well, three psychiatrists found him competent competent to stand trial. So Good. Yeah. <laughs> he was sentenced to 25 years for each of the six murders. Um, I don't know if they were able to get him on, like, the assault with a deadly weapon. I don't know. But in mm-hmm. 1979, this is kind of the punchline, he claimed that the demon possession angle was just a hoax. So... I didn't know that going in. I kind of reached that last, but I am kind of glad to see it because yeah, yeah. (laughs) you don't just like go around shooting people over two years if a demon's possessing you. And I think that's, what's a little bit different from your case is that was one instance, um, right. Which doesn't prove it either on either side, but it's also like, how long is a demon going to stay in you? How long is it going to ride your ass? Um, Yeah. Like, one day isn't long enough, but two years is too long, it seems like. Yeah, and this is why I was saying, like, this guy, whenever I was kind of talking about the stuff, is because people today, and I kind of agree, they still think that he didn't act alone um, because there was, like, sightings of, like, a teenage boy or whatever running from the scene and stuff, and they had, like some inconsistencies but i think that the reason they prosecuted just berkowitz is because they had to prosecute someone and they were eager to prosecute someone but he kind of made claims that he only killed some of the victims and that he was a part of a satanic cult and that other people in that cult committed the other crimes which is i mean that's scary. totally feasible yeah yeah and he basically claimed that John and Michael Carr, the sons of Sam Carr, his neighbor, were the other killers, which is impossible to prove because both were dead at the time that he made these claims. John committed suicide and Michael died in a car accident. Or so we think. Yeah. I mean, this, the whole sons of Sam thing would make sense. Yeah, exactly. And it does make sense, but we just, we just don't know. Um, but either way... Maybe Satan was involved. They were supposedly in a cult, but I, I, mean, I don't know. It's not out of the question. Like we already know that people in the late sixties and early seventies apparently had nothing to do. <laughs> yeah. But being satanic cults, so. Yeah, and the satanic panic is one way to either convict or get out of conviction. So you never know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's my creepy true crime for the day. What did you think? Interesting. I like it. I thought it was very creepy, but I I thought it was different than mine because it is much more delineated, like much more clearly that it wasn't a demon. It wasn't anything paranormal. I certainly don't think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I mean, the thing though is that if if he indeed was part of a satanic cult and he was doing it in the name of that and like the whole sam thing whatever like who is sam is it like a quote for, for satan and if so like did satan actually have something to do with this in the end just not in the way that we're thinking of it in which case then it is paranormal and it's kind of scary and it leads us into the whole topic of like like satanic cults and like satanism like is it real is it a thing can you actually communicate with like lucifer and like mm. you know what i mean like I don't know, like, how legit is that shit? Can you actually, like, make, a, like, a solid pentagram on the ground and then some, some something will come out of it? Like, I don't know. Like, well, that's all really interesting to me, but I also don't love talking about it. I think <laughs> you understand why. Um, yeah. Yeah. But don't you think that if we were to interrogate that line of thinking and actually try and find the source, which would be Satan, like, don't you think that would give us some answers as to why demons possess people in the first place? Maybe he is, like, 
running cults or whatever, and they're like choosing people to get possessed. Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe. Uh, I don't know that that would, for example, for my case, that that would help us find like the culprit of who decided to possess this little boy. Because like, I mean, you could make a thousand connections with a thousand people. Also, I wouldn't know where to start. I I don't even know who the Glatzel family knew that might have wanted to do that to them. Like, it's mm, very complicated. Yeah, um, it's, it's all very complicated. But yeah, I mean, you, you do have a point. Like, Maybe possessions take place as a consequence of other humans wanting to punish their enemies. Like, that'd be fucking interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, well, uh, it's funny because, like, Satanism as, like, a religion or whatever is actually pretty chill and it's about self-love. The modern form of it, which also is kind of like a deviation of the original anyway, is those things. But, like, whatever people were claiming like like whatever like satanism they were like um uh like associating themselves with back in like the early 70s with all the satanic cults and shit like that that was not what it is today yeah. like it was very different yeah i just wonder what I, I we should definitely do an episode on that i wonder what their intentions were because i guess like boredom or also just thinking that you're a fucking edgelord and being like yeah i'm gonna summon satan tonight you know which i already claimed to do in the beginning which obviously i didn't i went to in and out and i got animal fries and then i realized there's cheese on them and i was really sad um <laughs> cheese is the devil for your um gut microbiome so there's that yeah trying to kill me i swear um but there is a good there is a bright side to this i found lactose free cream cheese at safeway today and it was tasty wow. so look at you l- look at me disintegrating from the topic <laughs> into my lactose intolerance like it's the real devil like <laughs> listen i have it too and, and i can i can attest to that it's fucking <laughs> terrible so yeah. Yeah, for, all, for all i know i am possessed I mean... <laughs> oh also a follow-up on last week's episode oh I my god fuck off shannon <laughs> Unless I am, in which case we will never know. Okay, okay, so here's the tea, right? So um last week we were talking about we were talking about the Ouija board and <laughs> I as as those of you who listen know, I didn't want to see the names of the demons that I was talking about. Um and that's because like the very research that I did like said that it was bad to say the names or whatever. And so I didn't want to say them. Shannon, however, said them out loud. There was static when we when when the names were said. Like there was static. We we have the recording, but we didn't want to include it. Well at least we? I didn't want to include it. <laughs> I didn't want to include it in the final edit, and Mr. Andre has the, the the final file before before publishing. So before uploading, I took that out. But yeah, like that's what happened last episode. Um, so, so did we save the listeners' lives, or did we just sacrifice <laughs> entertainment value for no reason? I think we saved some people some trouble potentially, including myself. Hello. You um, already heard it, though. You heard it on the first, like, <laughs> recording, too. So that puts you closer to it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Um, anyway, uh, everyone, thank you for listening to this episode. If you have any ideas for future episodes, do let us know. We are on Twitter at TalkScary. You can DM us there. We're also on all podcast listening platforms. That's where you can listen to us and download our episodes. Um, like Spotify and Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Shannon, do you have anything? Um, don't sit in cars alone at night. Don't sit in cars after watching movies. Just go home and decompress there in the safety Dude, of your bedroom. That's so specific because sometimes I do that after I go to the movies by myself because I, I like doing that. Um, like after I do that, I'll I'll sit in my car for a bit and like just text or something. Um, and if the parking lot is kind of lonely, I feel like the creeps, so I'll just like leave. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be safe do out that. there, you know. Agreed. Um, don't eat any large meals before bedtime. Um, I have some experiences that one day I'll get into. That's, <laughs> like that's why I say that. Trust me, there's like reason behind it. Oh man, um, that'll be the episode. I'll, yeah, that'll be one hell of an episode. Um, the Mothman is real. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, episode twenty four. Ooh, exciting. Send us ideas. Uh, good night. Goodbye.